As you're seated, I want you to find a slip of paper, a small slip of paper. You can use your bulletin and something to write with. It doesn't have to be anything major, just a, a scrap piece of paper. You can write something on. You're not going to be writing an essay or anything, just a, a short statement. Once you get that uh, piece of paper, maybe a writing utensil, maybe one of the pencils in front of you, uh, there, you, if you need to, there are some envelopes you can write on. I hope Miss uh, Claudia and Miss Opal don't give me dirty looks because we're going to have to replace all the envelopes this week. But if you need an envelope to write on, you can, uh, you can do that. And I'm gonna, once, once you're ready, here's what I'm going to do. I am going to ask a question, and I'm going to state it twice. And as soon as I finish asking it, I'm going to time seven seconds. And in that seven seconds, which I know that doesn't seem like a long time, but it, you know, it really is. Seven seconds is actually longer than you think. And so I'm going to give you seven seconds to write down an answer to this question. And after seven seconds, I'm going to say stop and don't write anything after that. And I'm going to see what we get. Okay, so I'm going to ask the question. I'm going to state it twice, seven seconds. And whatever you have written down at the end, that's it. Don't, don't write after seven seconds. I'm going to, I'm going to trust you to just, just the honor system. We don't have cameras or closed circuit TV watching to see who writes after the seven seconds. I'm just going to trust you to, to do that. Okay, so here's the question two times in seven seconds, right? Wait. What is the number one thing you see that is a sign of Christmas for you each year? What is the number one thing you see that is a sign of Christmas for you each year? Seven seconds. Three, four, five, six. Seven. Okay, stop. Some of you are getting all sweaty. I'm just nervous. You can't, you're timing me. I'm nervous. We, we all have certain things that we see each year that kind of, kind of states a sign of Christmas. For you've heard me say, I turn my Christmas music on November 1st, sometimes October 27th or 28th, but I just do. I love my Christmas music. So for me, that, that kind of it, it launches my Christmas season. It is that Christmas music. Uh, as we go along. Now, by, by, uh, by a show of hands, who was able to, to write something down and just keep them there? A, Joe Hastings, what did you write? Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. You hear Merry Christmas, okay? Keep your hands up. Miss Kathy, what did you write? Lights, okay? Lights start showing up. Now, you got to be careful because some people put Halloween lights up. It's not the same thing, okay? It's not the same thing. Miss Joyce, what did you write? Decorations, okay? Earlene. Nativity scenes? Candace, what did you write? Family. Very nice. I like it. I like it. I see a hand up right there. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Santa Claus. And then I heard another. Christmas. Somebody say Christmas tree? Christmas tree. Rylan, one more. Christmas tree. Okay. See, so there, there are a lot of different answers, but for, for each of us, there are these things each year that kind of trigger the Christmas season. It's a, kind of a sign of Christmas. It's true. These things we just mentioned and many more are the things we, we kind of view as the sign of Christmas. But, but how about this? Generally speaking, right? Generally speaking, we begin to anticipate the Christmas season to kind of roll in early November. And I realize some people complain, boy, you know, Thanksgiving just kind of gets ramrodded. I don't know. I ate a lot at Thanksgiving. I don't recall it getting ramrodded. I enjoyed my Thanksgiving greatly, so I'm just, just saying. But, but Thanksgiving starts early November, and uh, most of us kind of, kind of expect that. But here's the thing. The signs of Christmas for us generally start November-ish. But how many of you know that the signs of Christmas started long, 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 long before that? The Bible speaks of the signs of the coming of Christ, which, by the way, that is Christmas, the, coming, the first coming of Christ. God stepped out of heaven and came to earth. That was the first coming of Christ. The Bible speaks of the signs of Christmas long before November. Let me ask you a question. You say, Pastor, all these questions you're asking us, you didn't, I didn't expect to get to ask all these. Well, that's just sometimes the way I roll. Is it more impressive if there, there are some football games on today, some NFL games. There might be one of the 86 bowl games on today. I'm not sure which bowls are on today. But is it more impressive if before the game starts, 
I tell you the winner of the game and the score that, that will be between the two teams. Like if I say the Falcons are going to win, they're going to win 28-14. to 14. And if they win, and if they win 28-14, is that more impressive? Or is it more impressive if after the game I come to you and say, you know, the Falcons won 28-14, I knew they would. You say, well, you didn't tell me that. Yeah, but I knew. Which is more impressive? If I tell you about it before the game or if I tell you about it afterwards? Before. How come? Yeah, it's like special knowledge. That second question, you're like, Pastor, that's such a dumb question. I don't even know how to answer. <laughs> because if you, if you predict it before it happens, it's much more impressive than if you talk about it after the fact. It's a prediction. It's impressive. There are statements throughout the Old Testament that predicted the first coming of Christ. And not, not only did it predict the first coming of Christ, but, but great details about the first coming of Christ. Do you know, there, there are statements in the Old Testament that predict how the Messiah will be, be killed. Do you know, it's not only that, but do you know there are statements in the Old Testament Thousands of years, you say, well, Pastor, how, how do you know that was real? We verified the books of the Old Testament are thousands of years old. We know that. And there are statements in the Old Testament about how, specifically how uh, the Savior would be crucified. Not only that, but how the Savior would be beaten and, and dealt with and persecuted. There are statements in the Old Testament thousands of years before the coming of Christ that predict how he'll die. And by the way, there are historical sources outside of the Bible that speak of the death of Jesus. So we know he was a historical character. That's a fact. You know, hundreds of years ago, they used to question the, the, uh, the historical Jesus. When I was in college, I, re I read a, a book by basically a liberal theologian called The Historical Quest for Jesus. And there was this debate years and years ago, um, centuries ago, and even decades ago, about whether Jesus was actually a historical figure. Did he actually exist? Or maybe he was just a myth created by the biblical authors. Well, now, historical evidence has verified, even outside of the Bible, not that we necessarily need that, but it does establish that there was a historical figure named Jesus of Nazareth. And so to, to question the historicity of Jesus would be like questioning the historicity of George Washington. You know, he's a historical figure. And, and the things that happened to him are history are a matter of record. And so there are statements in the Old Testament that talk about not only the coming of Jesus, but how he would be killed. And I don't know about you, but it's pretty impressive that you can predict something thousands of years before it happens. It's easy now when I'm talking about it, right? It's easy now to look back and I'll tell you, you know, Jesus, born in Bethlehem, born of a virgin, Born in this little town, and, and, and he was going to be born in, in, in an obscure fashion. It's easy for me to tell you that now, but what if I had told people about that thousands of years ago? And it all came true. <coughs> well, it did. And in fact, let me suggest to you that there were signs of Christmas thousands of years before Jesus showed up on earth. This morning, I want to take a look at just a couple of those. I don't have time to look at them all. <laughs> We're going to look in two different passages, actually three different passages, two different books. Two passages in Isaiah and one in Micah. And we're going to talk a little bit about the signs of Christmas. So if you've not already turned there, you can do that now. The book of Micah or book of Isaiah chapter 7 and chapter 9 and then the book of Micah chapter 5. I'm going to go ahead and, and read these passages. They're not long. I want to read them, and then I'm going to go back, and we're going to talk about the signs of Christmas. Listen, folks, from the beginning of, of Isaiah and early in the Old Testament, the signs of the coming of Christ have been prophesied. From Isaiah and Micah, and all through the Old Testament, the signs of the coming of Christ have been prophesied. Now watch this. Before we read these, I want to lay something out for you. As we look at the signs of the coming of Christ, which is Christmas, right? Here's the question I want us to walk away from here with. What signs do I see of the birth of Jesus in my life? Okay, now watch. Jesus, 
was God come out of heaven to earth. That's Christmas, right? Do you realize every time someone is born again, they are, an, they are experiencing kind of a personal Christmas. That is God coming out of heaven to come and dwell within them. How many of you know if you're born again, the moment you were converted, forgiven of your sins, Christ, God, God came out of heaven to live within you. It happened to me when I was born again. If you're born again, Christ, God came out of heaven to live within you. So in a very real sense, your time of salvation was like your own personal Christmas. So, so whenever it was you were born again, you can kind of celebrate your own little personal Christmas time, God come out of heaven. And so the question I'm asking is as we look at the signs of, the, of Jesus' birth in the world, then I want to ask, do we see these same kinds of signs as Jesus is born in our lives? Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now look at Isaiah chapter 9. Verse 6. Isaiah 9 and verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And then go all the way back to the book of Micah. Chapter 5, verse 2. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. The signs of of Christmas. Let me tell you a little bit about our, our two authors first. The book of Isaiah and the book of Micah. They were contemporaries, which means they preached in about the same time frame. I don't know if they, if they attended the same <clears throat> prophet conferences and the same prophet meetings and the, maybe they gathered in the, the uh, you know, the Old Testament prophets' clubs or something. I don't know if they did all that, but they were preaching at about the same time. Isaiah. Isaiah was a city preacher. He was in Jerusalem. At the time when Isaiah preached, <coughs> the northern and southern kingdoms of Israel were divided, and the northern kingdom had been overrun by the nation of Assyria. And so, Isaiah preached during a time we call the single kingdom era. That is, if you'll recall, if you go back, there was Israel under Saul and David and Solomon, right? And then after Solomon died, Israel split into the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And I've, I've talked about this before, how ironic it is. It seems like so often when countries split, they split into the north and the south, Take a look at that. It's very intriguing. Anyway, the only exception I recall is East and West Germany, but anyway. But the north and the south split in Israel. And the northern kingdom, the, the capital was Samaria, and we, we call it, we, it was called in the Bible Israel. And the southern kingdom, the capital of it was Jerusalem, and it was called Judah, because Judah was primarily the only tribe left in that southern kingdom, and there were still about 10 tribes in the northern kingdom, Israel. Israel was incredibly wicked the whole time it was the northern kingdom. And as such, God allowed Assyria to overtake it and exile its people, or a lot of its leaders and folks. <laughs> but Judah lasted a little longer. After Israel, the northern kingdom, was exiled, Judah, the southern kingdom, lasted a little longer. And during that time, Isaiah was one of his preachers. And Isaiah preached out of Jerusalem, the largest city in Judah at that time. Isaiah, some have called the evangelical prophet. 
Let, let me share with you just a few um, prophecies of the coming Messiah Isaiah shared. Now, don't, don't go looking these up because I'm just going to list them off kind of bullet style. But just, just listen, or maybe you want to jot the references down if you'd like, but just listen. The evangelical prophet spoke of the virgin birth of Christ in 714, the names of Christ in 9-6, his ancestry in chapter 11, verse 1, his announcer in chapter 40, John the Baptist, that is, he spoke of John the Baptist, Isaiah did. Isaiah spoke of the torture before the crucifixion of Christ in uh, chapters 50 and 52, his death for our sins in chapter 53, and his burial also in chapter 53. These are all prophecies and predictions Isaiah made about the coming Messiah. Messiah. And so as such, he's often referred to as the evangelical prophet. Tradition says that this big city preacher got on the wrong side of the king Manasseh. Now you have to understand, when Isaiah preached, there were good kings and bad kings that kind of went up and down, and so there were challenges connected with that. Tradition has that Isaiah was placed in a hollow log and sawed in two. In fact, Hebrews chapter 11 speaks of the prophets, some of which were sawed in two. It doesn't actually specifically mention Isaiah in that uh, Hebrews 11 chapter, but we know that according to tradition, Isaiah was sawed in two after he was placed in a hollow log. And so that was Isaiah. Now, we don't, we don't know nearly as much about Micah. Isaiah is what's considered a major prophet. Not because he's more important, but just because his book's longer. <laughs> And Micah, he's going those little minor prophets, not because he's less important, just because his book's shorter. Micah, we don't know as much about him, but we do know this. He was a country preacher. He, he wasn't in Jerusalem. He was out in the countryside preaching. Kind of like Hawkinsville, right? <laughs> and Micah was threatened by a lot of the forces coming in from the outside, and listen, the common people at that time, the worst thing about it was not only were they being threatened by forces from the outside, in many cases the common people out in the country, the poorer people, were being exploited by the wealthy who were actually Israelites. In fact, some of Micah's preaching was, was calling out the people who were exploiting the poor. Things like lottery and... Anyway... We won't go there today. <laughs> I'm just saying. The wealthy people were exploiting the poor. And Micah rebuked them for that. And so in the midst of these two guys, one city preacher in big city, one country preacher out on the countryside, two uh, very distinct styles, but both, both spoke prophecies about the coming Messiah. And I want to take a few moments and look at three signs that we see that Isaiah and Micah spoke about the coming of Christmas, of Christ, of the Messiah. That, that is, three signs of Christmas, and not signs that started in November, the signs that started thousands of years ago, signs that were mentioned thousands of years ago, thousands of years even before Christ was born. I realize it's been a couple thousand years since Christ was born. These prophecies were spoken a couple thousand years before that. Going back to Isaiah chapter 7, look at what he says. Isaiah at this point is rebuking the Israelites who were economically wealthy, you hear me? But spiritually they were poor, <laughs> they were impoverished. Financially they were doing great. Morally and spiritually they were in trouble. Sound familiar? Happens a lot. Sometimes... The worst thing that can happen to God's people is prosperity. Some of the greatest churches in the world were birthed in the, in the crucible. <clears throat> Some of the greatest songs we sing in the church were, were, were birthed in the crucible of life in the difficult times. And sometimes prosperity. I would, I would submit that the church in America is in trouble in some, in some ways because of our prosperity. Be people that I know who are, who are uh, missionaries or even uh, believers who go on trips over to the Ukraine and other. It's a little bit harder to do that now, but having years past. Go to these, these places where the, the income's low and it's cold. And we'll watch people walk miles to church in, in negative 10 degree weather and sit there for three hours in a building with no heat and, and ask for more. 
and go back. I'll never forget a friend of mine came back from his first mission trip. This is 20 years ago over to Ukraine. He said, he said, Johnny, I'm just telling you, something's wrong in America. He said, well, we, compl- we sit on padded pews and heat control, and we complain if it goes past 12. He said, we were over there. We, we would, two or three guys in a row would preach, and they were begging for more. Now I realize it's just what we've grown up in, right? It is what it is. We're, we're, we're used to padded pews and heat controlled and, and, and air controlled and all that. We're just used to that. I got it, but I'm just telling you, sometimes prosperity is our worst enemy in the church, and that's what was happening in Jerusalem. They were economically prosperous, and morally they were, they were in trouble. And so Isaiah was preaching to them, and in some ways he was rebuking them, but he was also telling about a time when one would come who would rescue them for all time. In chapter 7, verse 14, look at what he says. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. That is, you're going to know he's the Messiah, not by the virgin. The virgin's not the sign, or the virgin's not the thing. The virgin's the sign. <clears throat> if we put a sign down here on the corner of North House in Alberta, and we put a sign down there that said Green Acres Baptist Church and pointed an arrow this way, is that sign Green Acres Baptist Church? No, that sign points to where the thing is, right? A sign is not the thing. A sign points to the thing. So the virgin wasn't the thing. The virgin was a sign, a definite, yes, this is what's happening. This is real. And not only a virgin. There's no way to have a baby being a virgin except God does it, right? So we know that he was God. But she's going to bear a son. He's also going to be fully man. So what we find out here from Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, in the first half, I'll call it verse 14a, is Isaiah tells us how he lands among us. That is, how he would come among us. Isaiah, thousands of years before Jesus came, predicted the sign. This is a sign of Christmas, how he will come. He will come born of a virgin, uh, born as a man. That's how he will come. That's how he will land among us here on earth. Folks, that's an explanation of how the Savior would land in our world. Now let me ask you a question. Are you ready? What about your world? When and how did the Savior land in your world? You know, for me, I think back to when I was in middle school. And there were at least... There were more than this, but there were six people from the time I was in the eighth grade all the way through high school. Six people that I know of right off the bat that I don't even have to think about that God put in my life. People who knew Jesus, people who talked about Jesus, people who lived out Jesus, and people who talked to me about Jesus. And from the time I was in middle school all the way through high school, there were six people in particular. Now, I know there were others, but these six were were those that really come to my mind. And over the course of years, God began to draw me to himself and and put these people in my my mind and experiences in my life. And that, that finally it came to a critical point where just after my senior year in high school, I yielded my life to Christ. It it was a real time. It was a real situation where I confessed my sin to God. I received the the forgiveness of sin, the the substitutionary death of Christ into my life, and I trusted my life in Him. And it is that time, that's how He landed in my life. That was kind of how Jesus became Christmas in my life. What about you? Can you definitively point to a time And you can say, you know, I don't necessarily know the day, date, and time, but I remember the general circumstances. You know, last weekend, if you know, we were were gone, and I met a gentleman named Lee. And Lee and I began to talk about the Lord. And, boy, we we really kind of struck up, even just in a day or two, struck up a friendship. And Lee's born again. He's a chemical engineer. Really, really intelligent, sharp guy. He said, you know... Johnny, I have to admit, I, can't, I cannot tell you the day, date, and time where I was saved. 
But I can tell you the general time frame and I can tell you what was going on in my life. And I can point to that and say, I know that's when I became born again. That's when I became, I came to a place where I confessed my sin and I believed on Christ as my Savior and I trusted Him. And I don't remember the exact day, but I remember that time frame. See, He can remember how Jesus landed in His life. And I'm just asking you, is that something sitting here today? You can definitively say, I remember how Jesus has landed in my life. Isaiah predicted that Jesus would come out of heaven, God would come out of heaven and land on earth to a virgin born a man, and he did it. It was a definite set of circumstances where God came to earth. And I'm telling you, it is not a vague thing. Don't tell me, hey, do you know Christ is your Savior? Do you know for sure you're going to heaven when you die? And you tell me, well, I hope so. Don't tell me that. I'm telling you, the Bible says that we can know absolutely for certain a definite experience where Christ comes and, and kind of becomes Christmas in our lives. God come to earth. The same way Jesus the Messiah had definite details of coming to earth, Jesus the Savior. There should be a definite experience in your life where you came to Christ. And then look again at Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Wait, I thought his name was Jesus. I've actually got a sermon I've preached here before called Emmanuel. I thought his name was Jesus. Well, the, the name Emmanuel means God with us. It's describing in, in the biblical times. A name was not only a, a title, but it was a description uh, oftentimes of character and who a person was. And so Jesus, Emmanuel, that is God with it. God came out of heaven to us. And then look at Isaiah chapter 9 and verses 6 and 7. Verses 6 and 7 of Isaiah 9 say a whole lot about who Jesus is and how he leads. Watch this. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and watch this, and the government will be upon his shoulder. Bless his little heart. I wouldn't wish that on anybody. Well, wait. Except an omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, sovereign, immutable, perfect, holy, loving being. And that would be God. So, says e even, even the nations of the earth ultimately depend on God whether they realize it or not. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of His government and peace, there will be no end. Time and time again in these verses, it, it gives names to Jesus, describing Him. Uh, which one is it, Pastor? Which of these names? It's all of them. You know how many names it takes to even begin to describe Jesus? And then we run out of words. We don't have enough verbs. We don't have enough adjectives. We don't have enough adverbs. We don't have enough nouns. But we do the best we can. <laughs> And all these names, they describe not only who Jesus is, but watch this, how he leads us. He leads us as a counselor. He leads us as a father. He leads us as a prince of peace. He leads us as wonderful. He leads us present with us on and on and on. Look at Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me. Watch this. The one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. Translation, he's eternal. This is how he leads. Listen, one of the signs of Christmas was how he landed among us. Another sign of Christmas is how he leads for us. He leads with power. He leads with peace. He leads with joy. He leads as a counselor. He leads as a father. And one part of the beauty of Christ is the power and yet gentleness. Oftentimes we don't put those in the same sentence or the same person, right? Or the same place. Remember years and years ago, there was this commercial Y'all remember the commercial of the big old bull walking through rows of china and crystal? What was that? Was that some kind of an investment firm? 
I don't even get what that's about. But anyway, I just remember the picture. Right? You, you don't, the thing you don't want, if you, if you have a shop and you're selling expensive crystal, you really don't want a large bull walking through it. Unless it's that bull in that commercial, and apparently he can just... Mm, mm. He's this great power with great gentleness. That's Christ. And you begin to wonder, all these names seem to be different. One name is power, one name is gentleness. Those are two different things, but they all apply to Christ, and they explain how He leads us. Listen, folks, when Christ came to earth, He came in a particular way to lead us. And listen, when Christ came into my life, He came in a particular way to lead me. There should be definite signs in your life. If Jesus Christ is in your life, there should be definite signs of Christ leading you. In the same way that the prophets predicted Christ would lead the world, Christ will lead us in changes of attitude, speech, actions. Listen, with Christ's leadership in your life, He will lead you to have certain actions, certain attitudes, certain words, Certain behaviors that reflect him because he's leading you that way. And in the same way he came to earth to lead us collectively. The same way he comes into us personally to lead us. You know, Alyssa and I, my wife and I, who are now 23 and a half years in, we, we dated even back in high school. I don't remember where the point was where we, we figured out we had, we had known each other longer or been together longer than we hadn't, if that makes sense, in our lives. <clears throat> and remember last year, um, after Andrew's birthday, Alyssa pointed out, she said, you know, he, he, was, he was now the age, actually two years ago, he was now the age that you were when we were dating. And that kind of boggled my mind. It really did. It still kind of boggles my mind. Huh? And last year, um, during the baseball season, they, you know, before the baseball games, they call the players out by name and they run out to the, the home team runs out to the first base line and the, the visiting team runs out to the third base line and, and they call them out by name. And Alyssa said, I got to tell you, I was sitting there watching and they called Andrew's name out and he ran out and she said, I just had this flashback of you running out on the football field. He said, he looked just alike. She said, he was just like you. Now, I didn't teach him that. I would, if I was going to teach him, I'd rather teach him to run like some major league baseball player, <laughs> not me. But my, my genetics are there. I mean, my DNA is there. He can't help it. I'm in him. Now, listen, Jesus, if you're born again, if, if you have a personal Christmas, that is, God has come out of heaven to live in your life personally. Jesus Christ lives in your life. And as such, whether you know it or not, he is living out certain characteristics of himself through you. And if he's not, if he's not leading you to that, if, you're not, if, if there's not progressively more and more characteristics of Jesus being lived out in your life, folks, there's a problem. In the same way that Christ came, God came out of heaven to lead us collectively, Jesus came out of heaven to live inside you and lead you collectively. Do you know what obedience to God is? It's just Jesus doing what Jesus does through me. That, that's why when we blow off <clears throat> disobedience, not clear, clear acts of disobedience, it may be the way we live, it may be uh, where, where we go, who we marry, how we talk, and all these things that we just blow off obedience. The thing that disturbs me is not the act itself, but the fact that Jesus is, that they're, the person's claiming Jesus is on the inside of them. Jesus would not be living that out if he were. How he leads us. And so here are the signs of Christmas. How he landed among us. How about your personal Christmas? When did he land in your life? Here are the signs of Christmas. How he leads for us. He leads his wonderful counselor, Almighty God, Emmanuel. And by the way, he comes into your life personally to lead that way for you if you know Christ. And if that's not happening. Now one more thing. Look again at Micah chapter 5. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah. <laughs> when this prophecy was written, Bethlehem was Kathleen, Georgia. Right? Who, who is from a 
really small town. I mean really small, like 500. Miss Claudel, where? Dexter. Yeah. Who else? Carl, I saw you raise your hand. Yeah, except we know about that because of Little League. So. It's become fam famous. There's some of these little small towns that nobody's heard of other than us <laughs> and the 500 people who live there. That was Bethlehem. Folks, we're talking about Bethlehem thousands of years later. Are you kidding me? Bethlehem's all over the place. It's Kathleen, Georgia. Who knows about Kathleen? But people from Kathleen, I mean, I'm not criticizing it because I'm from down that way. I'm not, I'm not trying to cut it down. I'm just saying it's small. Not that many people know about it. And Bethlehem was like that when Micah wrote this. And people were probably going, what? Bethlehem, who? <laughs> and he said, let me tell you something. Out of you shall come forth to me one to be ruler in Israel. Now, if he had said, out of Jerusalem will come a ruler, they'd go, oh, yeah, I get that. Large town, large city, big time. It's like saying uh, somebody came out of New York City and became famous. <laughs> Which of the thousands that have come out of New York City have become famous are you talking about? Small towns. You know, they put up a sign. Somebody comes out of there and plays professional sports or is a professional singer or whatever, you put up a sign, <laughs> home of so-and-so, because that's the only person who's ever come out of there that's famous, because it's a small town. But watch this. You are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel. There is this place where God came to earth, the place Bethlehem. <laughs> Oh, Pastor Johnny, that, that's a famous city. Well, it is now. But I'm talking when this was written thousands of years ago, nobody knew of it. You know why that city's famous? Now, if you lived in the Middle East, you might know Bethlehem for more than that. It's, right now, it's controlled by, not, not by Israelites, not by Israelis, but Palestinians. But, but, that's people who are really into the politics and all that. The average person, you say Bethlehem, what do they think? Jesus. If you know anything, I realize there are some who know nothing about the Bible or God or Jesus. I got that. But the average person who knows something about the Bible, something about Christmas, even if they don't believe it, if you say Bethlehem, they could at least connect it with Jesus, right? The only reason Bethlehem is famous it's because Jesus came there. And so a sign of Christmas, watch this, not only how he landed among us, not only how he leads for us, but where he lives around us. That is a sign of Christmas. Now watch this. You say Jesus was born in your life? You say Jesus was born in my life. He came. I've had my personal Christmas. When I say Bethlehem, we think of Jesus, don't we? When people say your name, what do people think of? Is it Jesus? Because I'm telling you, if he's living in your life, increasingly, when people say your name, they'll think of Jesus. In the same way Bethlehem was made famous by Jesus, if you're made famous, let it be because of Jesus. I'm going to name some cities. Okay, I'm just going to name some cities. And I want you to shout out the first name or activity or event that comes to your mind, right? Maybe it's an industry. Maybe it's a person. I want you to shout out the first thing that comes to your mind. Detroit, Michigan. That's what I thought. Huh? It's at tough times, but we still think of automobiles, right? We think of Detroit. Washington, D.C. Be nice. I should have prefaced that one, Pastor Micah. I heard politics. I'm not going to say what else I heard. How about this? Carl, I might not let you answer this next one. Hershey, Pennsylvania. Milton Hershey. Orlando, Florida, Disney World, and I was listening for Mickey Mouse too, right? 
that, listen, there are certain cities that are tied to certain people or ideas. When I say Bethlehem, Jesus is tied to it. Now watch this. God came out of heaven, came to earth, to a city called Bethlehem. And now people recognize Jesus when they see Bethlehem. When we say Bethlehem, we then think of Jesus. When people say Johnny Ellison, God help, that people would think of Jesus. You want to know a sign of Christmas? It's where he lives around us. God help me that my life would make Jesus famous the way Bethlehem has. And vice versa, that when people say my name, they would think of Jesus the way when they say Bethlehem, people think of Jesus now. Because when Jesus shows up in a place, he makes himself famous. That's good preaching, Pastor. Where he lives around. These are signs of Christmas. That God came out of heaven and came to earth as Christmas. When God stepped out of heaven and came into your life to save you. It's your own personal Christmas. So i got to wonder. How did he land among you? (laughs) I realize the English isn't exactly square there, but you get the drift. How did he land in your life? Did he? If you can't explain it, I'm just saying, maybe today's your day to make sure of that. What if you were to say, I know how he landed in my life. On December the 21st at Green Acres Baptist Church, I came and gave my life to Christ. And I remember leading up to that, all the things God did to bring me to himself. How, how he leads for us. That is, God came out of heaven and came to earth to lead for us as wonderful counselor, Emmanuel. The government will be on his shoulders. All these things, prince of peace. That's how he lead. That's how Jesus came out of heaven. God came out of heaven to lead among us. That is how Jesus comes into our life to lead through us. And then where he lives around us. Where does he live? If he lives in your life, I'm going to tell you something. Increasingly, when people say your name, people will think of Jesus if he lives in your life. The same way he came out of Bethlehem. When people say Bethlehem, they think of Jesus. From the time of Isaiah, the signs of the coming of Christ have been prophesied. For this world and for our lives. What signs do I see of Jesus' birth in my life? There should be increasing signs of Christmas in your life if Jesus is born there. You hear what I'm saying? There was a great Scottish Bible expositor and preacher named Alexander McLaren. I want you to listen real closely to what he wrote. I love this quote. McLaren said, we may have as much of God as we will. Christ puts the key of the treasure chamber in our hands. And he bids us to take all that we want. If a man is admitted into the bullion, that is gold, vault of a bank, and told to help himself, and that man comes out with one cent, whose fault is it? That he is poor. In Christ, God has opened to us the vaults of heaven to experience and to know and to speak and to think in the world. If you come out impoverished spiritually, whose fault is that? There are signs of Christmas that should be shown up in our lives. Jesus, who's come into our lives, Jesus leading through our lives. And Jesus living all around us. So when people think of us, they think of Jesus. And I'm just wondering, can you sit here this morning and honestly say, I have, far from perfect, Pastor Johnny, but I'm seeing, I think, signs of Christmas in my life, in spite of me sometimes. Maybe it is that today's your day to say, you know what, today's the day for Jesus to land in my life. And on this Christmas season, December 21st is going to be my personal Christmas. God, come out of heaven and come to dwell and and be birthed in me. And today's your day. Pastor, how do you do that? I'll tell you what, in just a moment, I'm going to have everybody stand. And if you'd like to know more about how, look, I'm not going to make you do anything that would embarrass you or single you out at all. 
But you can come let me know, and I'll let you go and speak with someone. Guys, we'll find you one of our gentlemen to go with. Ladies, we'll find you one of our ladies to go with. <clears throat> and you can talk to them, and they'll explain to you about how to know Christ as your Savior. Today's the day. Or maybe you're here and you say, I know that Christ has landed in my life, Pastor. I'm, I'm just praying because I've, I've stagnated. I, I know I have a personal Christmas. But something's going on. And maybe it's just a time just to come and get before the Lord. Here, here at this altar, these, these steps, we, we reference as an altar. It's not some, these steps aren't super spiritual, but I'll tell you where they are. They're right here just as you've heard God's word. It's a great time to come and get before him as we worship together. And then people who are here, believe it or not, they're praying for you. They don't want bad for you. They want good. They want God's best for you. So you don't have to be concerned. Maybe it is, it's time for you to come and say, Pastor, I believe this is the, the church for me. So I can come and grow and allow to learn to Jesus to lead me. And you come today and we'll explain to you how you can become a member of this church body. Whatever it is God's doing in your heart, I'm going to pray. And we're going to stand. I want you to respond. Pray with me. Father, right now, help us, Lord, to obey you. Help us, Lord, if you're, if you're speaking to us on a certain matter, help us just to respond. Not thinking a lot about tomorrow or what's next or what will happen, but just being obedient right now. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Why don't you stand right where you are? You stand.